All right, we are live. Welcome to PT Pinecast. Before we get started, do you want to say thank you? Thank you to our friends from your CBD store. Find them online at CBDRX4U.com. Uh, over the counter CBD use all over the place. It's over the counter. People use it for sleep, wellness, uh, stress reduction, just because they're trying it out. How is that going to affect your patients' treatment plans? Do you know? 100% you know? All right, we'll find out the ABCs of CBD online at cbdrx4u.com. Uh, we also have some uh, pint glasses that uh, they're giving away at our website, ptpintcast.com. So go there and check it out or check out more about CBD. Again, cbdrx4u.com. We are talking about, well, the show must go on. We're looking inside uh, physical therapy for musicians tonight with uh, Janice Yang. So let's start the program. Let's do this thing. All right, here we go. Coming in hot. Welcome to PT Pinecast, a podcast that saves physical therapists from missing out on amazing insight, remarkable ideas, and motivational stories. In the world of physical therapy, I'm your host, Jimmy McKay. Find us online on all the socials at PT Pinecast, the Instagram, doing it for the gram, or the Twitter, the Bird app, or the Facebook, whatever. Why do I keep saying the in front of those apps? I shouldn't be doing that. Uh, just check us out there. Follow us so you never miss an informative episode. Don't forget to subscribe to the show. People hear a subscription and they're like, how much is that going to cost? It's free. It's a podcast. I don't know where you've been, but podcasts are free and they always should be free. Uh, so subscribe there, whatever app that you like, uh, the Apple thing, uh, the, the Spotify. I don't know why I keep putting the in front of things. Uh, what else we want to say? Oh, questions or comments. We do love when you ask questions and make comments. This is this is very much of this atmosphere and not of this atmosphere. Uh, so drop uh, questions or comments during the during the show, whenever you want. Shout it out. Uh, throw an emoji in there. Let us know where you're watching from. I'm always very excited to where to find out where people are watching this from. What you do, where you are in your journey. So reach out, drop it, let us know if you're live. Uh, great episode for you tonight. I actually came across uh, our guest because uh, she won a big fancy award. Yeah, we're going to make her talk about that. I can brag about her. If she brags about herself, it's weird, but I'm going to brag about her. Uh, she won a big fancy award at the uh, Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy's uh, annual award ceremony, which I got to put on a suit and sit in my living room and host this year. And uh, we're going to bring her on because I thought her backstory is really cool. Uh, physical therapist, former musician, and works with musicians. So, like, you know, I've met other PTs who work in the performing arts, but never specifically musicians. So let's, let's bring her on here. Uh, welcome to the program, Janice Ying. And there hey, she is. How's it going? Janice, Hello. how are we doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm good. Uh, cool. You have a sparkling water. I am drinking. Some people would say almost water. I'm drinking a Mick Ultra, which is like ah. beer. But I just had an IPA and I have to have a beer because it's tradition. But I'm like, listen, I just I got to have something a little bit lighter. So cheers, yep. Janice Ying. Cheers. 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 First round brought to you by our friends at Owens Recovery Science. They are a single source for PTs looking for certification in personalized blood flow restriction rehabilitation training. And the equipment you need to apply it uh, clinically, properly uh, in your clinical practice uh, at owensrecoveryscience.com or on their podcast, the Owens Recovery Science Podcast. Uh, Janice, I mentioned your big fancy award. So I'm bragging. <laughs> you're not bragging. Uh, tell everybody what the award was. And like, it's a big, I mean, Academy of Orthopedic PT, it's kind of a big deal. It was it was an incredible experience. So I got the Emerging Leader Award um, from the Orthopedic Academy, and um, apparently it was the first year that they've ever had this award. So um, it's a huge huge honor of mine, and um, I'm very very thankful for people putting my hat or my name in the hat. And here we are. What uh, so you know you know the the people that nominated you? What were some of the things that they were they were talking about? What are some of the you know in terms of leadership? We just did an episode with Jamie Schreier. Cool. Leadership re requires you to lead others. Yeah. So <coughs> uh, sorry, as I just choking an almond there. Who were you leading? <laughs> um. Well, I. It's it's hard to say because I mean I think for me my my whole purpose for becoming a PT was um to work with musicians and so. I think for me, a lot of it was because this is not a niche that is very common or a lot of people do. So it's just trying to kind of discover ways 
to help people figure out how to approach this population in the first place. Cause it could be super overwhelming if you, even if you are a musician or you have that kind of background, like how do you out, even get, wrap your head around all the instruments? And so I think for me, it was just kind of helping push the field of performing arts medicine or performing arts physical therapy as, as a whole, but then also within my little, like little world over here, um, kind of pushing that part of the profession forward. I mean, the, the word that comes to mind there, and I'm going to say it so you don't have to sound like you're bragging, this is Trailblazer. <laughs> trailblazer. Eric Mera talked about, um, you know, in terms of pushing diversity, equity, and inclusion, he's like, if you, if you blaze a trail, make sure you turn around and <laughs> make sure other people know about the trail. It's not, yeah. really, not really trailblazing unless others follow. Then it's you just cutting a path for yourself. Right. Well, I mean, that's I think that's one thing that I've been saying for a really long time is like, I know what I'm doing and I'm very confident in what I'm doing. But none of that even matters unless other people know that that's what's happening as well. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Yeah. So that's been a big area that I've been working on is trying to just let people know that, hey, this is a thing. This is actually a thing where people do care and have that expertise. And yeah. this is where you go to find that help. It sounds, it sounds simple when you say like, this is a thing it, because people, <laughs> yeah. and I'm, I'm not making fun. It's like, if nobody does it, then nobody feels like they have permission to, to really do it yeah. to plant a flag and say, totally. oh, no, I'm going to make a life out of this because yep. there are people. So, so let's go backwards before we, come forwards which okay. is your, what's your background like talk about like your you know as a musician i don't want to brag or anything but i did play the flutophone in third grade that's good i i haven't played that oh recorder we call it the i can play i can play a mean hot cross buns on the that's recorder like Janice, <laughs> that's the only song i know so talk to us about your background as a musician like what'd you play like and like when did you yeah. start like, tell us about it oh man so i i started piano when i was four i was like one of those tiny little people. Um, and then I so also, I, I was also tiny at four, but not playing the piano, but keep going. Right. I think we we're all tiny at four, but you know, um, yeah. So I started piano at four. Um, I picked up the violin in the second grade. So that probably would have made me what? Seven, Six, eight. Seven, yeah. Anyways. Um, so I did both instruments pretty competitively throughout high school, um, got into college on scholarships for both instruments. Wow. Um, then I was a piano major as well as a music education major. Um, that was kind of like a compromise. My mom was like, well, you need a real job. So get a get an education degree. If you're gonna do the music thing, get an education degree. But I mean, music educators are incredible people. So, I mean, they know so much as itself. So in my mind, I was like, all right, that's fine. That's cool. Like I, I can be a music educator too. Um, so I did both instruments and looking back, I probably wouldn't encourage like past me to do both instruments. I would have just been like pick one and not the other because the, the amount of playing that a music major has to do um, on a single instrument is like already astronomical. Um, so doing it on both and having the scholarship demands on both was just like super crazy. So um, when you're on scholarship for an instrument, so forgive me on my ignorance on this. No, that's okay. How many, I mean, one instrument. So is that, is that akin to saying you are on scholarship for two different sports? I mean, those are instruments, but they're not the yes. same. Correct. Wow. And, and it would be like different sports where there's no overlap. Right. 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 Piano. So like for piano. Okay. I'll get, I'll give you a, a rundown. So what a typical day would look like, you know, you have classes, but then I would do maybe like four hours of practice and then I would have lessons. And then I would have to, as a piano major, I have to accompany voice, like vocalists in their lessons. Um, so I had to learn the pieces to uh, play with them. And then I did chamber music and like, so if you add it all up, we're looking at at least like 30, 40 plus hours of playing piano, just piano a week at least. And then you put on violin. So violins, like, you know, you, you have your individual practice. So I probably was doing less because it was kind of my secondary instrument. Um, and something had to give, right? I can't do 80 hours of playing. Um, so violin would be like a couple hours of practice every day. Then I have orchestra, like four or five hours a week, and then chamber music, and whatever other gigs came your way. So 
you know, it, it really adds up really quickly. Um, in the in the end, like on a week, both instruments just let's just talk about the physical, not the school, you know, the didactic. Yeah, yeah. How many hours were you physically playing an instrument? I would probably say on on average, probably like 40 to 50 hours. And then like if if you're talking about performance, like per, like gearing up for performance, then I don't know. I don't even want to calculate. It's too much math right now. <laughs> I mean, all the, you know, our audience, mainly physical therapists, physical therapist assistants. Like, I don't even need to say like, wow, I wonder what would that would do right. to your body at all. Right. Right. Doing something. And you're, I mean, these are fine motor skills, right? Piano, right. And this is never played an instrument. So you talk about piano and violin, but then again, like also like violin, you're in a you're in a unique neck position holding mm -hmm. that instrument. Shoulder, as, shoulder, shoulder position as well. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, there's a lot of physical demands that neither musicians or PTs actually like think about. Sure. And it's not until someone is sitting in front of you as a patient or you're experiencing this as a musician, they're like, Oh shoot, like I my muscles are really tired. <laughs> like I you know, I love the Genesis like, oh, shoot, my muscles are really tired. I just spent 60 hours last <laughs> week. Keep in mind, Jimmy hasn't played an instrument for 60 hours in his entire life. But <laughs> 60 hours in a week, that is crazy. And, yeah. oh, by the way, you're a college student, so I'm sure you're getting 8 to 10 hours of sleep. Oh, and yeah. No well, problem. Yeah. yeah, no problem. All right. So so that, you, you, you graduate. So I'm, well, I'm so in the meantime, sorry. So in the meantime, I got injured. I so I oh, no. got it. I got a pretty major injury um, after my sophomore year, which resulted in me getting shoulder surgery from playing the violin. Um, and I had gone to PT. I had gone to acupuncture. I had done like the whole nine yards, and no one knew how to fix me. Like my teachers didn't know how to fix me. They would watch me, and they're like, "Well, you sound good." And I would go to PT, and they're like, "Well, you're strong. You look good, and you have I have full range of motion." Right. Uh, okay, and I was like, "Well, I still hurt. Like <laughs> something is something is wrong." <laughs> and um, so after my surgery and recovering from that, and I, I finished my degree. You know, I did all the recitals and stuff, but I, I decided I was like, you know what, this really sucks. Like. There has to be a way, there has to be something that can be connected between the two sides so that musicians are more knowledgeable about their bodies because I didn't get anything in right. music school. No knowledge about... That, that. That's akin to saying, hey, Janice, I want you to come play water polo or run track. And by yeah. the way, we're not going to have an athletic trainer or a physical therapist right. or medical team right. whatsoever. You're going to do this this dynamic, difficult physical movement. And yeah, you're on, I mean, just, we'll just show you how you play piano and violin. That's about it. Right. I mean, luckily I had grown up with sports too. So I did like tennis and taekwondo. So I was very used to being active and like knew more about my body and like how it, things move. But musicians unfortunately don't have that prioritization um, in terms of understanding how things work the the inner workings and how things move sure. well you're, you're um, paying attention to the hard thing which is piano and violin and this the second <laughs> which i'm sure none of your instructors were emphasizing or prioritizing for you which is your physical health yeah yeah but i mean i tell people all the time is like well your main instrument is actually your body because without your body you could have a gorgeous violin sitting in front of you and no sound would come out unless you do something to it so like take care of the thing that does something to the instrument your main instrument is your body. That's going to be a quote we use after this episode. <laughs> That's right. Your main instrument is your body that you have yep. to make sure when that goes. To, all right. So you have the in, uh, the injury. Yep. What was your long term plan? Were, were you, it was always music education or you, you don't know. Maybe you want to go play. I don't know. Like, you know, for an uh, orchestra or symphony. My, or my plan actually was to um, go and continue per piano performance. And then, um, you know, I love teaching. So my, my goal at the time when I was still considering music was to um, go and become a piano professor. Like that was kind of like where my, where my aspirations were or oh. some kind of piano teacher. Um, so That's that cool. didn't happen, <laughs> but I did yeah. teach after I graduated for, for some time. Um, while I was doing all my prereqs for PT school. All so. right. Well, before we get there, how did you, how did PT come into the picture 
in terms of like, hey, this is interesting or I want to go this way? How, where does PT come in, into Janice's story? Well, I mean, I like I said before, I had tried PT and it's like it's one of those things where I saw how it could be or like I saw the potential or I, I knew that they had PTs have the right information. It's just that like through no fault of my therapist or anything like that, but like they they just hadn't like stretched their imagination to that to where I wanted to go. Um, and so, um, you know, really it was it was just trying to find that bridge. And I, I felt that PT was kind of the right avenue. Like I had thought about OT, I had thought about going to med school and I just something about it just didn't seem like that was where I wanted to take it. And so, all right. So where'd you go to school real quick? Where were I went to USC, USC. I've heard yep. of that. Yeah. Yep. That's cool. Um, became a physical therapist. Were you thinking about merging your former and your future kind of like radio and physical therapy? Like you were like music and physical yeah. in PT school or was yeah. that more in the middle? That, or yeah, that was pretty much my intention going in, um, mm -hmm. that I wanted to, um, that I want, I wanted to be a PT for musicians. Um, and I knew that even though a school couldn't specifically help me with that, I knew that I wanted to become the best PT as a whole that I could first, and then I could take the rest and yeah. do my thing. You had all the, you, you had all the language, right? If I, yeah. if Jimmy McKay wanted to be a, a performing arts, physical therapist and work with musicians, a musician would listen to me talk for four seconds and be like, you don't know anything you're talking about, but you but knew the language. You can learn though. It's not that. Sure. Yeah. You definitely had that like inside knowledge, right? Yeah, that is right. definitely to help. But I agree with you. You could, if it was a passion, I believe you can find your way there. Yeah. Um, but you, you had that. You were like, I know exactly what you're talking about. Yep. I, I've been there. Yep. I don't want to brag or anything, but I've I've practiced 50, 60 hours a week. <laughs> you can kind of like it's not it. something I'm very proud of because now these days I tell people not to do that. But it's like, you know, you, you're you older and wiser and you learn from your mistakes. Do as I say, not as I do. <laughs> exactly. <The reason laughs> All right. So you graduate and this is this is a focus of yours throughout PT school. Yeah. And where do you go? Like, how are you lining this up? Are you saying I need to go find a place that does this already so I can work there? I'm going to forge my own path. Like walk me through that. Um, well, while I was going through clinicals, I, I did a lot of kind of like background research to see if there are any clinics that specialize in, in, in it. And performing arts physical therapy is a very broad category. Um, right. There's a lot of areas that people see patients. So, you know, the big one is dance. Like there's a ton of dance PTs. Um, there's a few musician based PTs, but it's not, it's like very few and far between. Um, but it's growing now, like there's more people. Um, and then there's gymnastics, ice figure skating, you know, the circus. So, um, finding a performing arts PT, it, most of it was dance. And I knew that, I mean, it would be great, but that's not really where I was going to go right. it's um an, but it's you it's a completely different art it's like saying right. sports but i don't want to work with soccer athletes i want to yeah work with and i mean i work with dancers i treat dancers i work with a dance company but you know like my passion and like where, where i really wanted to invest my mental effort to learn and really get granular about was with the musicians yeah I, and you can i mean we had elliot cleland on not long ago he works primarily in marching health. Yeah. And that's even like a whole nother world. Like, you know, so he was telling me was, we were playing YouTube videos and he was showing me this crazy stuff to do oh, yeah. with, with drum yeah. rack on them. And I'm like, okay, this is, this is a lot. Well that, yeah, you, that's a whole nother beast. If you have sure. athletes that are doing this and that was really what Ellie was talking about was these are, yeah. these are athletes. These are marching athletes. These yep. are performing artists who are, who are also athletes. Um, you need to treat them as such. So, yep. all right. So let's talk about your current practice. Like where, where are you working now? Who do you, you know, who do you work with? And we'll, we'll dig into the importance of, uh, of what you yeah. get to do. So I, um, I own Opus Physical Therapy and Performance. So it's a mobile out of network cash based, um, physical therapy clinic. So it's out here in Los Angeles and, um, it's, it's been, it's, it's been interesting cause I, I started it right before the pandemic. <laughs> so it's like, I mean, as most things. Um, but I mean, it was, it was a brainchild before the pandemic and, um, it actually 
has been really nice because a lot of people don't want to go to clinics at the moment. And so being mobile gives me a lot of freedom. Um, but also now that people know, you know, we we're talking about creating awareness to this service, like people now know that there is a PT who works with musicians. And so I have people come in from all over and, you know, because it's so rare, it's like kind of a foreign concept, you know, like it's kind of gotten a little bit more um, momentum at this point. So, so where are you finding um, people are finding out about you? And I'm, I'm going to guess before you answer it, okay. is, you have a patient and it goes really well, right? You have a, you have a, yep. you have a performing artist yep. and it goes real well. And then that person goes off to their own life and they're around someone else that gets injured. And they go, you know what? Yeah. I got a girl. Exactly. Okay, exactly. Good. Yeah. Good. So, that's, that's I mean, good. that's, that's a big thing. Um, part of, part of also what we do or we, I mean, I, cause it's just me, um, is, uh, I, I am, I provide physical therapy at the Colburn school, which is a really elite music conservatory here in Los Angeles. Um, it's across from Disney hall. And so, um, I provide treatment to the really super talented music students there. They're uh, undergrad and graduate students. Um, so, I mean, that's an incredible experience. And just having that kind of cred behind my name also that I work with these students, like, gives me a little bit more background as well, because they're like, oh, well, she really like, if Colburn can trust her, yeah, then, yeah. you know, so how'd, I got to know, how'd you, how'd you start a partnership? Like, how did you win their confidence over with an elite school like that? You know, that was a that was a long process because, well, the process to get in with the school was not long, but the relationship building and all of that. So it's like it's really through networking, through um, one of the performing arts medicine, like the performing arts medicine association. So I had a contact and she taught at that school. And when that opportunity opened up, she's like, hey, I have the perfect person go talk to her. And then when I talked to them, it was like, they're like, okay, when can you start? So, you know, but it took a long time of networking and building all, all, that trust yeah, with that person to all good relationships really should, right? A good relationship. Yeah, yeah. And they'll say, you know, some people will say, and I've said it before, but I've, I've kind of amended it. Like, so it's like, it's not what you know, it's who you know. And I'm like, nah, it's what people know about you. So it's not just who knows you. It's like, what do they know about you? Because right. like, I could know you be like, yeah, I know Janice. Eh, not so much. Or I can know <laughs> Janice. Yes. Got yeah. it. Great. Everything. So it really isn't just who you know. So it's not like meet as many people as you can. And it isn't foster as many relationships as you can. It's foster good relationships. Yeah. And good relationship really is just, it doesn't have to necessarily always from the beginning anyway, lead, want to lead to an outcome. I'm not hanging yeah. out with you because I want something from you. It's no, like no, no. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And I think for, for me, I'm really big about building quality relationships that last a long time, you know? So, um, and I'm, I'm, I try and like pass that love along too. If there's an opportunity that is good for someone else, you know, it, it's, it's, it, it works out well and it's, it's served me really well over the years. Some people will say, and this goes to any physical, this goes to any person, right? Which is when an opportunity comes along, you got to hold that. It, it, you know, they say fake it till you make it. And I'm like, well, if that opportunity isn't something you definitely want to do or going to be good for the person, you being able to pass them off to someone and refer to them. And I'm not even talking about just a patient. I'm talking about a relationship. You, you know what? Yeah. I might be able to do that for you, but you know, Janice, She's she's better. Like she's better at this than me. And that will build the relationship for all parties. Yeah, absolutely. Fine, absolutely. All ships. Yeah. 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 I right. agree with that 100 percent. You jumped out on your own. You you start working yep. with Coburn and things are and, and this is, you know, what, a year ago or just, you know, a little longer. A year and a half. Yeah. Yeah. Not that long ago. So, hey, like opening a business during a pandemic. <laughs> How'd that go? Like growing pains or what? It was interesting. I mean, it's definitely growing pains. And I think for me, because I worked for a hospital based outpatient clinic for nine years, in which I loved and I really enjoyed it. Um, but I think going off on my own, I think the hardest thing for me was that there were so many different places that were like pulling me in different ways, like different opportunities would come up. And 
trying to stay focused and like, okay, well, this is what I want to create. And would this opportunity help me do that? Or is it just something like lucrative that sounds cool, but it won't help me out in the long run? Say that again, because if Jimmy McKay five years ago heard that, he would have saved <laughs> a lot of headache and heartache. Say that again. Um, so yeah, it's just trying to make sure that you're picking the right opportunities to take advantage of because there are going to be a lot of opportunities, whether you realize it or not, that come your way. And I think trying, if you have a vision, trying to stay focused on that and making sure that whatever it is that you're taking on is going to help your end game. And yes, so thank you for saying that and thank you for repeating it because again, if and and I came into PT as a second career student, right? I should have yeah, yeah, me too. I should have been way wiser and way smarter. <laughs> and the episode we just recorded in the last hour. So if you haven't heard the Jamie Schreier episode, go backwards and do that. This can help a lot of different people. And I am as guilty or guiltier than most when this happens, which is someone gives you an opportunity, what do they tell you? Take it. Right. Time, take it, take it, take it. And yeah. it can feel like that's the only way to go or that's the only thing to do. Um, but you you should ask yourself that question, which is not like, am I above this? Is this beneath me? That's not what we're saying. We're saying like, okay, is this going to, is this something I can do quickly? Is this like give someone a few lessons? Is this going to, but the question really should be, is this going to, uh, is this going to take me off the path or too far off the right. path from right. where I'd like to be? And I think I heard a quote a couple of weeks ago, which really resonated, which is, um, the decisions you made five years ago are coming to fruition now, most likely. Oh, yeah. And, and yes. you have to remember the decisions you're making now are going to put you where you are or are not five years from now. So I think these those two ideas go hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's 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 really important. And like that's not not to be said that I haven't made mistakes before in the past. Like I definitely have taken on. I've done so many pro bono things I can't even count. Like, you know, and so finally I'm like, okay, well, what is this pro bono thing going to do for me? Like, um, not that I'm not happy to help people out. Like, there's the, a good if the answer is, if the answer is, it, it makes you feel fulfilled, uh, fulfilled, that is absolutely and, the only reason for, for it. Yeah. And for me at that time, it was really fulfilling. So I was fine with it. And like, there was, there's no resentment on that. Like, I just know that I can only do so many pro bono yeah. before I go broke. So let's right. figure this out. Let's figure this out. <laughs> All right. So, so that's where you are currently. That's what you're doing currently. Yeah. Um, let's get specific in terms of like maybe someone out there is listening and they're saying, "All right, Janice is doing the doing the thing. She's walking the walk. She's violining the violin. She's pianoing the piano." <laughs> you can tell my music terminology is on. Point. Yeah, it's super technical. It's good. What do you, what do you what do you see with uh, musicians? What are what are the things that you typically see? And I know you're going to say it depends because we're it does. and everything depends. But what are <laughs> what are some of the things that PT should be asking you musicians about their unique demands or different types and styles of instrument? I imagine come up. Yeah. So um, I would definitely say that. Um, it really, you really need to be thinking about the individual demands of the instruments that they play. And a lot of um, wind players will actually play multiple instruments. So kind of getting a sense of what their overall demands were, you know, we were talking about how much I was playing in college and what my performance demands were. So kind of get a sense of like what their practice schedule is, what their performance schedule is. Are they in this studio for you know if you're in a studio you could be in there for like eight hours like just cranking away so you know like kind of get a general sense of like what's going on and then what I always try and like do in myself is like start deconstructing things so I'm really about big about deconstructing things so you can build it back stronger right so like so you need to break things down to a small enough level so you can understand how to tweak things. You can't just kind of do a shotgun approach or throw the kitchen sink at it and just overhaul everything because I'll tell you right now, the musician is just going to go away. Like they're not going to listen to you. So trying to figure out, okay, well, let's try tweaking this one thing. Don't tweak 10 things, tweak one or two things. So we know if that works or not. And then trying to build on top of that, build on top of that, build on top, like build them back up to whatever level that it is that their goal is. Um, that's, I think that's really important just as a whole, like looking at musicians. Do you have them, um, 
bring their instrument with them. I'm imagining. Yeah. Because, I mean, yeah. that's a, that's a huge part imagine. of what I do. Yeah. So, um, you know, you can even do that virtually too. And so, you know, you could, you, it's not as good if like versus if they're in person because it's not 360, but you can have what I have them do is I have them film four angles, like front, back, side, side, and then play the same excerpt. And then that way you can kind of extrapolate a 360 view, right? Kind of cool. Yeah. And so um, then you can like break it down. You can go through frame by frame and like look at big, big picture items. I always tell like students, I was like, don't look at a picture, look at a video because that's going to give you the best sense of what's actually happening. Like if you, if you were to look at a violinist and they were like, leaning into a note, you would be like, oh my gosh, their posture is so bad, but it, they could just be there for like a split second because they're always yeah, like moving around, you know, it's different than like if you were watching, doing like a running analysis or a gait analysis or some, on someone because they're just, it's one, usually just one plane right. um, and you can stick them on a treadmill and they're pretty much doing the repetitive motion over and over again. But with music, it's like every millisecond is something different. Um, so it's just kind of understanding kind of globally what people tend to like sit in. So I, I call it their home base. Like, what is your home base? Like, where do you go to? Like, what's the average right. that you're sitting in? And then you can deviate outside of that. But because they're going to be in home base the most. They're going to yeah. be in positions. So where if their home base doesn't look great, if their home base is like that slouch posture or whatever, then that's not that's a home base that needs to be tweaked. Right. But if their home base is like fairly decent, then maybe it's not that issue. Maybe it's something else. Okay. What, what should PTs be asking uh, musicians that maybe they're not? Mm, I would probably say like the biggest thing would be their playing schedule or their playing regimen. Um, and, and then also if there's any sudden changes to their routine. Um, some musicians, like if they change the gauge, if, you know, if you're talking about a guitarist, there's different thickness of strings. And so if you have thicker strings, it might be harder to push a string down, which would cause more effort or more strain on those muscles. So if there's any big change that they were just trying something out or trying a technique out um, or in practicing that, um, sometimes it's something that they don't really kind of connect the dots with, but it could be something really crucial. That's what you're there for. You're connecting the dots. That's what I'm there for. Well, you've got to make sure you ask the question enough questions to right. get the dots. Yeah. 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 I mean, it's just like with any, like treating any like ortho patients, like, okay, well, what was different around the time of your injury? If it's not traumatic, what, what changed? What, what happened? Like anything out of the ordinary. Yeah. And then they're like, oh, well, blah, like, you know. So besides uh, my lack of musical ability and your musical ability, we do actually <laughs> have something in common is you're also a podcaster. I am. Talk about yeah. it. Beyond the so, Practice. So yeah, I have a podcast. It's called Beyond the Practice Room. And um, basically it's um, my colleague Kaylee Miller and myself. And we bring on, um, it's mostly geared towards musicians, but we bring on healthcare professionals or people kind of in the science world um, to kind of bridge that gap and open up that communication uh, between musicians and scientists so that musicians know that scientists do care about um, musician health or different aspects of that. So um, yeah, it's been, it's been really, it's been really fun to have these conversations. We had someone, we had an audiologist on a couple episodes ago um, to talk about hearing health and how she works with um you know, orchestral musicians and hearing devices, or uh, we had someone who um, is a vocal coach for the trans community and talking about how she coaches them to find different registers of their voices to match what they feel wow. like they are. So, I mean, it was just incredible. So we've had some really amazing um, topics that I, I don't think anyone really talks about. Um, but hopefully it's like framed in a way that, you know, both sides can really start to uh, like wrap their heads around it and really just try and come together. I heard a quote. There's this show. Uh, there was a show on AMC 
And I'm only watching it like on replay. I never even heard about it when it was on TV. It was called Halt and Catch Fire. Did you ever see huh. that? No, I haven't. Great, great show. It doesn't matter what's. It's about computers and technology, but it's actually it's just like a you know it's a drama. Mm-hmm. And the line was so it's about computers, and it was like it was set kind of in the beginning of like the 70s or early 80s when like Apple and Microsoft were coming about and personal yeah. computing has come about. And the line, I promise, I promise is going to make sense. The line, <laughs> the line from one of the characters was, the computer isn't the thing. The computer is the thing that will get you to the thing. And that was the line like, listen, the computer is not the thing. I'm on a laptop right now talking to Janice about physical therapy for musicians and her podcast. The computer is allowing me to get to the thing. And I think that's what a podcast does. So you're talking about I'm having conversations that I that w- wouldn't happen. Yeah. This vocal coach existed, but she needed the thing, the yep. thing you built, your podcast, to make sure that she could get her thing to you and then the people that needed to have. So yeah, the podcast isn't the thing. It's the no. thing that gets you to the thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's been it's been an incredible experience. Like something that I never thought that I would do. Like, cause I hate hearing myself talk. Like <laughs> it's like the most painful thing. In my- <laughs> I'll tell you this though. I was radio for 15 years, been podcasting for five. So I've been doing this for 20 <laughs> years. You never get used to it. Yeah. It's, it's really weird. And even yeah. like when I present and you're like on a mic and you hear yourself over the, it's, I, I do not enjoy that part, but I, I, I do enjoy like speaking, but. Well, I always say too, like, you know, there's a lot of technology involved right now, right? Janice has got a microphone, we got lights, we got cameras, we got, you know, laptops, but it really is, again, it's the thing that gets you to the thing. It's spoken word, but that yeah. the computer or the or the, the phone helps you to remove geography. What it does is it right. takes, this is what our caveman ancestors did. They had conversations over yeah. around fires and it's like, our brain is still wired for conversation. And that's yeah. what I think a podcast does and you're able to get into some really i mean again 10 years ago before podcasting was oh, yeah. thing, that wouldn't have made any sense but now it's like oh yeah super niche is actually exactly where you want to go with mm-hmm. so yeah. beyond the practice room um where can everybody find it where all the podcasts where all the podcasts are we're, we're all, on all the things on all. <laughs> that's cool um what's something that you've learned by being a podcaster that you that surprised you anything that like you were like wow i did like when you when you closed the laptop or turned it off or hit publish on an episode that you were like wow that was really whatever oh um i don't know i mean i i think for me that that conversation with the vocal coach was a really enlightening experience for me like not because like I just there was so many there were so many like nuances that I just didn't even realize. Like, I mean, I I probably could have like thought about it, but like I just never my mind never went there. It's, it was just, like such an incredible way to have someone break it down and kind of explain their process. Um I don't know. That was that was a really cool conversation for me. I love everything about what you just said. And that that was I was I wasn't expecting that. Yeah, but, but that's something you hear a lot, which is like the uh, the 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 concept is called the adjacent possible. Mm-hmm. Janice could have gotten to that whatever that your guest was talking about. It would have just taken if you imagine like life as just this gigantic chessboard, and you can go forward, back, left, right, or diagonal. Right. And the adjacent possible is like wherever you're standing, it's all the squares that are touching you. Mm-hmm. And you could have gotten to where she or he or she had gotten. It yeah. would have taken you a, a circuitous path and a long time of continuing to open doors and go that way yeah and the cool thing about conversation is it lets you connect where you are with where that person got to in yeah. an instant by a question or a comment or a story right and that's really when innovation happens is when you connect things that don't make mm-hmm. sense until they make sense yeah and i mean i think i i love hearing people's stories too so like another example would just i mean i'm sure you have this experience too like right. Another example, like one one of the pioneers for musician health, we had her on and, you know, she's been pushing musicians health for decades. Like her, her book was like one of the first books that I bought um, to start kind of learning about this stuff. And, you know, she, she came, she's coming out with a new book and she started talking about her parents and like how they had survived uh, the Holocaust. And it like took this huge turn and it was just like, Wow, it was like just so incredible to hear kind of how people are molded 
um, based on not only their own experiences, but kind of the experiences of like other people who are close to them. You can't take that away. You shouldn't like you can't remove your own history and even further your own biases or view or view. Right. You are the sum of your experiences and your views and what you've seen and how you've seen it. And I remember I had a, a somebody in PT school, I will not name him, but <laughs> I did my first, you know, 10 to 15 podcast episodes. And I was, I was cherry picking people that I looked up to, right? I was right. The, the, the cool people in PT. And he said, what are you going to do? How's this podcast going to be sustainable when you've already interviewed all the cool people in PT? <laughs> Interview them again. Yeah. And that hit me like a, a ton of bricks because I was like, oh, you don't get it. I think you can learn something from everybody. everybody. If yeah. you are patient enough, if you ask the right questions, if you're honestly interested, yeah. you, if, you, if you're not learning so something from everybody, if you're, that means you're not trying or you're just, you're not listening. Well, I think that's, that's what I tell students about PT is like, if you are bored at your job as a PT, you're not doing it right. Cause there's so many things that you can explore and do like, you should never be bored. I mean, maybe you have boring moments, but like you should never be bored as a whole. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. All right. Uh, who, who was that person that you interviewed that was the, that wrote the book? Who was like the, the OG of, uh, Oh, of her name is Janet Horvath. Um, and she wrote a book called playing less hurt. Um, and so that was kind of, that was published maybe in like, the, I'm totally going to butcher this, but like probably in the nineties, I would say. Mm -hmm. And, yeah. um, and yeah. You have her on. Was that kind of a geek moment? Was that like, hey, this is kind of cool? Oh, yeah. We were like, let's get her on. And then she was like, yeah, let's do and this. She, I was like, yeah. she was so gracious and so nice. Like, I it know. was, yeah, it was great. I tell people all the time, I'm telling you, like, ask your hero on your podcast. Like, the yeah. word is, like, they say no. I'm like, but they're right. Not, they're not going to. They're probably going right. to say yes if you exactly. ask. Honestly. Um, uh, last thing I want to ask. So, you built a niche physical therapy practice during a pandemic. <laughs> uh, if someone were going to do it, you know, maybe not during a pandemic or now on uh, any like little bits of wisdom, like things that you learned that you'd be like, hey, make sure you at least have this mindset or this thing. Or what would you want people to know about starting a niche physical therapy business? Yeah, I mean, I, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I think something that was really important for me and that I had kind of I, I, I already knew this about myself that I again, could get pulled in a lot of different directions. So like for me, I, I made a very conscious effort to really sit down and think about what opportunities I took on or even like the patients that I took on. It's like, okay, am I going to, because I'm mobile, like, am I going to take a patient, you know, 15 miles away from me, 15 miles in LA could be like two hours, like, mm -hmm. you know, so like, is that patient going to be worth it for me in the long run to establish that connection? Or is there someone better who can see them who's closer to them? Or like kind of balancing those things out. A lot of it was like being very picky about what I took on, either patients or opportunities or whatever it was. Um, it sounds almost counterintuitive though. It, it totally <laughs> is. Because I mean, like for me starting my practice, I was like, I had, I, I mean, to be honest, I had a really hard time in the beginning being like, okay, well, am I really going to be, am I going to niche down that hard? Like how, how specific am I really going to be or should I be? Cause I didn't want to be so specific that I would isolate myself from just treating regular patients. Um, or if musicians never found out about me, then I would have no patients because so it, that was a big struggle of mine. Um, even like when I was developing like my Instagram content, I was like, okay, well, how, how specific do I really want to be? And um, I, I feel confident that I, I took the right steps in the sense that um, I, I decided to niche down and just stick to that. And yeah. um, I'm, I'm really glad I did. So I think that was probably the biggest kind of overarching theme. Um, the other thing that I probably would say that I was really glad that I did and the pandemic gave me time to do it was to kind of get all my processes locked in and kind of figured out so that when I started to get busy, I didn't have to scramble and like, oh, shoot, how do I bill for this? Or what do I do? Like, I kind of already generally knew. And then like, I could get a little bit more specific when that situation came up. So 
I'm, I'm really happy that I took the time to do that. Marcus Lemonis, did you ever watch the show The Prophet? I love that show. People, my, my friend was on that show actually. Yes, what, what product? I love that show. Well, like- no, she, she, sorry, she, I take that back. She, she was on, it was kind of like the apprentice style um, where oh, he cool. did like, he selected like a protege. Um, and she, she won the show. Like I gotta and, watch that. Your first you, one, yeah, and so you still see her pop up on the on the episodes where she's like a consultant and stuff. So she's I my would, college friend. I would uh, go work for Marcus Lemonis for free. For oh, he's, years just to learn from he that. He actually is super smart. I I really love watching that show because people, product, process. And you're talking about process, and he says most of the time your product is most of the time product is great. Yeah, it, it's it's usually a process issue. Um. You know, and sometimes it could be one person at your organization that's tanking the whole thing. So he said, yeah. like, when you break it down to something, the three P's with Marcus Lemonis, you, you just look around. And you're like, okay, how's our this? That's good. Problem's not there. Okay. So you were able to lock up that thing that, that probably like, was weighing on you, which is process. Yeah. You lock that up. So when yeah. you started to crank, that uh-huh. wasn't an issue anymore. You made your weakness a strength. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, and I knew that was a weakness. Like I knew like my weaknesses were marketing and procedure. <laughs> so marketing, I could still work a lot on, but procedure. Yeah. But like, look, look what you did have. You had people. You're the, I mean, you're it when you're a one person, you know, organization, yeah. you're the people, but you're like, I talk the talk. I've walked the walk. Got it. People's done product is I'm a great physical therapist. I've done this. So I understand yeah. the audience. So you had I'm going to say you had two thirds, but you really had more than two thirds. But you 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 did an, a step that a lot of people on the profit do not do, which is admit and recognize the weakness. <laughs> people don't hey, do that. As musicians, you learn real quick from an early age how to like pick yourself apart. So I'm really good at that. <laughs> uh, uh, well done. Well, so your weakness was, you you had a strength that solved your weakness, which is good. Yeah. All right, go. uh, Janice, where can people find you? Uh, let them know about you know the website if they want to follow you on socials. We can throw it on the bottom of the screen, but yep. uh, the podcast as well. Just share it with them. Yeah. So um, my website is opuspt.com, O-P-U-S-P-T.com. And then my Instagram is opus at opus underscore PT. So Got those it. are probably the most common places you can find me. Um, Love it. And, All right. Time, yeah. to do, time to do three questions. Are you ready? Let's do it. Let's do three questions. All right. All right. Three questions brought to you by our friends at the uh, at Fusion Med Staff, FusionMedStaff.com. They are leaders in hashtag travel physical therapy. Find them online at FusionMedStaff.com. Where there are people like in L.A. or Alaska, doesn't matter. Uh, they need physical therapists. Uh, they also have job transparency. A lot of times you're like, well, if I want to find out about this travel assignment, I got to go through this big rigmarole. I got to email you and pretend that like oh, I, I just want to find out more, but I've got to give you so much information. They're just like, listen. Here's where we need a great physical therapist. Do you want to come here or not? And you're like, yeah, I do. And then you go there. I'm pausing for dramatic effect. That is the process. All right. So find them online. Fusionmedstaff.com. Uh, first question on three questions, Janice, is a where question. You're in, I mean, you're in Southern California. Pretty solid. Hard to beat that. Hard to beat. But where would you want to go if you could go, like, once everybody's free to move about the country? Where's somewhere you're itching to go? You know what? I love Colorado in the summertime. Yeah. I'm not so much like a winter Colorado person, but Colorado mm. in the summer is perfect. Like I love hiking. I love all the streams and stuff. So, um, you know, I have a lot of like good childhood memories uh, road tripping across Colorado. So that that's yeah. where I would go. And they have people there. So check well, them out. Yes, they have people there too. Use your medstaff.com where there are people there that need PTs. Uh, second question is a what question. What okay. is something the audience uh, should read, watch, listen to a book, movie, podcast that they would learn from? Hmm. So probably one of my favorite books is um, called The Go-Giver. Um, mm-hmm. I forget the author, but it's 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 classified as a business book, but it's really about building relationships, kind of what we were talking about. And, um, you know, just kind of that give and take and just knowing that relationships don't have to be transactional. Um, yeah. So That's, more of a flip on the the go getter. It's more of a go giver. Yeah, it's it's a great yeah. book. I I really okay. encourage people to read Good. it. I like hearing books I haven't heard about, so I can put yeah. them on my back and I can put yeah. them. Yeah. Uh, last thing uh, on three questions: Who is someone the audience should know more about? 
Man, there are so many cool like performing arts medicine sites. Um, probably the the one that the couple that I really like um, is uh, the circus doc. So Emily Sherb is a PT and she treats a lot of circus performers. PT. Um, was that? Uh, is she a physical therapist, a yeah. doctor? Yeah, oh. she's a PT. Smells um, like another, another episode coming on the future. <laughs> yeah, she's great. Yeah. Um, and then there's actually a researcher out in um, Canada who I just met, and her name is um, Nadia Nazar. I might be butchering her last name, but Nazar Nazar, I think. And um, she does physiology. She's a um, bio biophysiologist, and so she studies the physiological effects of drummers. So she has like rock drummers and she'll like hook them up on like with, with like EMGs EMG, and like, yeah, yeah all, all that stuff. And it's, it's incredible. She does a lot of cool research. So um, yeah, both of them are really cool people. That'd be a cool episode to do. Checking out some drumming. I'm into yeah. that. <laughs> yeah. right. uh, that's three questions again from our friends at fusionmedstaff.com. Uh, uh, last thing we do on the show is the parting shot. Let's do that. Parting shot brought to you by from our, uh, brought to you by our friends at the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Find them online at orthopt.org. If you're looking to niche down, yeah, they've got some details on performing arts. They have a performing arts special interest group within the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Uh, current concepts of orthopedic physical therapy, a great roadmap if you want to get that OCS and level up your orthopedic game. Uh, they go micro with tissue tolerance. They've got a course on tissue tolerance. Macro with uh, the running athlete has been something that's been booming for them. So uh, find out more if you want if you want to find learn from the leaders in orthopedic physical therapy practice, the Academy of Orthopedic Physical Therapy. Uh, parting shot, your last chance. Janice, for a mic drop moment. We would never drop a microphone, though, because we no, are professional. No, don't never do that. drop the microphone. <laughs> uh, but a theoretical mic drop. What do you got for the audience as we wrap up today? I think the biggest thing would just be to keep an open mind and ask lots of questions and learn because you can pretty much learn from anyone about anything. And so if you encounter a patient that you don't know much about what it is that they do, just ask them and they're more than happy to share. And I think that's that's the biggest thing that's helped me um, learn all the instruments or learn how to treat instrumentalists who play all the different instruments um, because it's 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 a real it's the right thing to do. And so it's the right thing to care for your patients and make sure that they know that you're looking out for them. Love it. Uh, Janice and Opus Physical Therapy. Thanks for coming on. Congratulations again on the award and being emerging. Thank you. An emerging leader. I guess you've already emerged now that you won the award. I have yeah. emerged. <laughs> I've emerged. Uh, Janice Ying, thanks so much for your time and dropping by. All right. No worries. Thanks. Thanks.